So uh, there are various ways in which evil can control us or the animal soul can control us. Sometimes it's subtle uh, to the point that um, one of the Hasidic rabbis said that sometimes the animal soul comes in, a gar in garbs of the most pious person and it tries to act as if you, um, or it tries to convince you at least in ways that you think are righteous, but in essence, they're really evil. For example, for example, I think we've brought this example in the past, but if there's someone that needs my help right now and um, my uh, animal soul comes again in these garbs and tells me, well, maybe you should be praying. Go and pray. But this guy needs my help. Someone fell on the floor and I'm going to go and pray. So prayer might seem to be a spiritual act, uh, again, a very pious uh, uh, activity. But if it comes in lieu of me actually helping someone who needs my help, then it could be very evil. So sometimes, again, this, this wickedness of the Russia comes in very subtle ways or it's expressed in very subtle ways. Sometimes in much, much greater ways and much stronger ways uh, where it's quite evident to all that this is an animalistic uh, expression or an evil way of doing things. Now, the the Russia, he is separate from the Tzaddik in the sense that he continues on with that, with that emotion. So, for example, some people might say, I'm going to go pray while someone needs my help. That's evil, as we mentioned. But um, the Benoni or the Tzalik immediately can catch himself, the incomplete Tzalik, because the complete Tzalik doesn't have any evil, but can catch himself and say, oh, 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 well, actually, no, what I'm doing is wrong. And then he goes right back to helping. The Russia is the one who perpetuates this animalistic act. To give you another example, I don't know if we've mentioned this in the past, but I think every single negative act has three stages every animalistic act has three stages take anger for example but we can do that with any other seemingly negative quality right so the first stage of anger is anger i, I feel i feel this 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 thing boiling within me anger the second stage is rage where anger now becomes almost uncontrollable i launch this rage and I become the worst person I could be. The third stage is that perpetual action of anger, which is in, in this case called grudges, resentment. So the Russia follows through with all of these three stages. The incomplete Russia or the complete Russia do, do so. The Bainani somehow is able to control anger, maybe it feels, but it doesn't allow it to become rage. It does, certainly doesn't become uh, allow it to become resentment. So I would say that that's really the main difference between the Tzadik and the Russia, or the Benoni at least, and the Russia. That is that the Russia enables the nihilistic soul to take over to the point that it becomes its, that person's perpetual state, which is really, I mean, he might have, again, regrets and remorses, but he's not able to control it anymore. The rage became rage. The resentment became resentment. And that's when really it becomes very wicked, very Russia, very, very bad. So that's that's just to elaborate on, on this. Again, I welcome comments, questions, disagreements. Whatever you may have, please feel free to speak your mind. How do you okay. define the grudge? Yes, please. William, yeah. Define, define a grudge. Sorry? Define a grudge. Oh, define a grudge? Um. I think the most simplistic way to define a grudge is to harbor negative feelings towards a person. And those negative feelings can become very toxic to the person. That's, that's how I would define. How would you define it? Well, sometimes negative feelings are justified. Yes. But and it's, hard, it's hard to ignore it. That's true, and that's human nature too. Sometimes, you know, we it, it, it's very hard to let go because they justify. It. But in a way, as uh, Nelson Mandela put it, that resentment is like drinking poison and hoping that our enemy dies from it. 
And uh, in many ways, by harboring that negative feelings, it hurts us more than anything else. And maybe that's one method of of letting go, recognizing that it's toxic for us. Um, nothing to do with other person, but just for us, it's toxic. We shouldn't hold on to that. And the other methods, I mean, there's the spiritual method in which you try and understand. Sometimes it's very hard to see it. But try and understand what was God's hand in this. Because if we believe that everything is from God, nothing, there's nothing, there's no coincidence in life, as they call it. And we have to ask ourselves, why did God give this to us? What was the, the divine message in this? And by extracting the divine message from the episode, then we're also enabling ourselves to let go of this toxicity. And rather relate to it not as a negative experience, but even sometimes as a positive experience. Because after all, we see the divine message in it. So it's another way of, of, of letting go. Um, the third way of letting go, and by the way, that was Joseph's way. Joseph could have uh, harbored and then taken his revenge against his brothers. But eventually he took care of them. Eventually he took care of them. And... Didn't take his revenge uh, at all. He actually welcomed them into Egypt. He, he made them find favor in the eyes of Pharaoh and so on. But that's because he himself said, you thought you did me bad. You thought you were you, you wronged me. Well, Elohim chashava letova. You are wrong because God had a good plan all the way through. And I choose to focus on that. That's That was Joseph's way. The other way, is simply to uh, try and, which is a harder way, understand the other person that may have hurt me. And, and when I say understand the other person, very often people do what they do just because of the context of their lives. Sometimes they've had a rough childhood upbringing. Sometimes they were in a bad spot. Something happened to them at that stage of life. So trying to see the entirety of the person sometimes can help us explain their behavior and and then also maybe even forgive their behavior but anyway the different methods but but you're right you're right and that's the whole point of the tanya to refine our nature to refine human nature but it is hard if there's any other methods here or, or general comments again feel free to share them too you know, Rev, I am I'm just thinking yeah. about uh about Joseph and what you just said and and how ultimately that that's true that the brothers are welcomed and there's the reunion and uh all is is forgiven and it's looked at as as God's uh direction and, and such. But before that, there is that human nature where he seems to get a little even with them by creating you know, scenarios that create a lot of stress and distress. Um, so it's kind of like both right. aspects are there. Right. So you can say that he did keep maybe some resentment. <clears throat> so that's one way of looking at things. The other way of looking at things is to put ourselves in Joseph's shoes. And maybe he's saying to himself, if I have to live with these people, because after all, we are brothers and my goal is to unite with them. Let me see if they really did Teshuvah. Let me see if they are the same old people and then the conclusion will be it's impossible to live with them. Or let me see if they are really changed. If they are really changed, then I'll be able to unite with them and really let bygones be bygones. So I think that that was in a way, in, in a simple way, his strategy. He was testing them, maybe not necessarily holding a resentment and taking his revenge, but really testing them. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see how they act. I think the ultimate test for them was um, uh, keeping Benjamin, right? Remember he said that, I'm going to imprison Benjamin now, their youngest brother. And what Joseph was really doing is he was testing them in the way, well, you abandoned your brother, it's me. You don't know this yet because you don't recognize me, but you abandoned your brother. Not only did you abandon your brother, but you actively sold him and abandoned him. Let's see if you do the same now. To protect yourselves. Let's see if you do the same with your younger brother. Because if you do, that means you haven't changed. 
And then Judah comes. Remember the story, right? It's just so powerful. It has so many life lessons for us. But Judah comes and says, No, I will be the guarantor of this child. I'm not letting you do this, Joseph. When Joseph sees that, he says, Oh, okay. They are changed. And that's actually when he decides to reveal himself. So what do you do with a grudge if the other party has not changed mm. their ways? So that's a good question. How do, so you, let, maybe, how do you let go then? Right. So maybe that's why method one and method two really don't relate to the other party at all. They don't seek to 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 uh, activate or at least even investigate change in the other. But they come to the conclusion that even if the party hasn't changed, for me, holding a grudge is toxic. So I'm not, I'm going to do it for me. And the other way is also, again, seeing God's hand in this. Well, God had a message for me. It's nothing to do with it, but the other person is other was just a messenger. And if he doesn't want to change, that's his problem. But I need to see the divine hand in this So, and the message for me, for my growth. So I think that's why, again, that's a good question, but that's exactly why those first two methods don't necessarily relate to the other person changing or not. Many years ago, Rabbi yes. Tolushkin came to Scottsdale yes. and, he gave, and he gave a talk and the, the synagogue was packed yes. and he asked the question, how many people in the audience have a sibling uh, or close relative that they do not talk to? Hmm. And I was surprised because I had my hand up, but almost everyone in the synagogue had their hand up. <laughs> and then Rabbi Tolushkin said, and of course, it's their fault. <laughs> yes yes but it's true look i mean uh we live in a society like that that and it's <clears throat> relationships sometimes are strained a little too quickly um and that's because of grudges or because of other things sometimes again you say you're right it's justified but the way again to let go is those methods and the other methods too but i think that's why you know it's no coincidence that uh, Judaism is very much aware of, of, of that aspect of human nature. How do I know this? Because we've inserted in the daily prayer, multiple prayers, multiple prayers that speak about letting go and speak about not holding grudges and speak about uh, even forgiving. There are prayers of forgiveness. But then, for example, at the end of every Amidah, three times a day, think about this. How do we conclude the Amidah? We say, Please, God, my tongue from speaking bad. And then we say, May my soul be like dust to everything. Like dust. Dust doesn't hold a grudge. Dust, dust is nothing. May my soul be like dust. We also have the bedtime Shema that we've spoken about. <clears throat> Before we go to sleep, we say, I forgive. I let go. We also have, of course, the prayers. <clears throat> Sorry, of, of uh, forgiveness. Whether it's the tachan on the supplications or whether we ask God to forgive us by forgiving others. So, so Judaism, I think, is very much aware that it's a dominant part of, of, of the human nature, but uh, it gives us, in a way, prayers and tools to, to deal with it. You know, it's interesting just to go back to that prayer that we conclude the Amira with, but we say that there's a juxtaposition here because if you've ever paid attention to it, it's just so powerful. But we say, which means, may my soul be like dust to everything, even those things that should bother me, may my soul be like dust towards them. And then we say, and that's the immediate verse that comes thereafter, Open up my heart to your Torah. And here the prayer is alluding to this idea that if my soul is not like dust, if I allow this toxicity to permeate, then my heart will remain closed. But if my soul is like dust, then my heart can open up itself. So the openness of the heart to the blessings of life is really dependent on this quality of enabling my dust to become like dust to everything, especially to those things that can be toxic. 
That's the juxtaposition, which is a very powerful statement if you think about it. But I just want to dwell on that for a second. Okay. I mean, um, please uh, feel free to share your comments. Otherwise, we can continue. By the way, again, we were speaking about anger, right? Anger, rage, grudge. But that's true for any other animalistic uh, uh, element. <clears throat> think about, I don't know, lies. There's the the white lie or lies. There's the lie itself. Then the lie becomes a story. That's stage number two because you always have to cover it up, and then becomes a perpetual part of your of your speech of your behavior. So that's lie again. You can do that with every every inclin every animalistic inclination. <clears throat> okay, and and again, so the, the point of 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 us saying that is because. That's the one of the main differences between the Russia and the Benoni. The Russia allows himself to go to stage three, to resentment, to a perpetual state of lie, to whatever it may be the inclination, the, the inclination that overcame him, uh, whatever that inclination may be. But the Benoni, on the other hand, is able to squash it right when it erupts. I have anger. Okay, I'm going to control it. I'm going to wait a few minutes. That's, by the way, one of the methods of the Tanya. You wait a few minutes or maybe a few days, depending mm -hmm. on how, uh, you know, hot-headed you are. But you wait. So the Bain is able to control it immediately. Okay. Uh, let's continue. 271. Okay. In his description of the various levels of a Rasha to whom is good, our author begins at the top with the least evil Rasha. A Rasha to whom is good is one in whom the evil rules over the good. But this rule may be temporary, occasional, or incomplete. Such a person may commit a sin, but he does not, but he does so not wholeheartedly and without pleasure. He is one in whom the balance of good and evil are in a state of unstable equilibrium. So he is prone every now and then to be upset. Right. So that's that's what we mean by saying a Russia to whom is good. What does it mean to him is good? That sometimes he has revelations of goodness within him. So even when he sins, his divine soul knows that it's doing something wrong and it it sends that message to the person saying, hey, you're doing something wrong. And the person intuitively knows that, feels that. That's a Russia to him is not, uh, uh, sorry, to Russia to whom is good. Russia to whom is evil is a person that doesn't even feel that anymore. He's so apathetic to his divine soul that when he does bad, he just does bad. He doesn't feel the the badness that he that he's doing by the way that in most people most people it comes from just repetition doing the same evil act again and again and again until you become really apathetic to your divine soul that shouts at you and says this is wrong it comes from other other sources too but usually repetition is probably the most common of all but again the the russia to whom he's good Years that divine soul, but he's not able to follow its calling all the way through. But it still exists, which is a good thing. By the way, speaking of, of that divine soul that shouts at us, the Russia again is not able to, to allow it to control himself, unfortunately, to allow the divine soul. But that, in a way, is the whole point. I think, again, there's no coincidence, right? That's the whole point of this month. Right now, I find ourselves in the month of Elul. Elul means to search. In Aramaic. But Elul also is an acronym for many verses, as the sages point out. One of them is Anile Dodi Dodili, I am to my beloved, and my beloved is to me. It's interesting because during this month, we also read Psalm 27 every day, which has one of the most powerful verses, at least in my humble eyes, in the entire book of Psalms. What is that verse? The verse that again we recite every day of this month and thereafter also a little bit into the high holidays but is the verse that says to you my heart says i uh, have we we request your face or we desire your face to you my heart says what does that mean that in every one of us there's there's a heart there's a soul that speaks and what does it say that it wants God's face. It wants a relationship with God. But sometimes we shut it down. 
And we say that, yeah, I hear you, divine soul, but I'm not going to follow you. Thank you for being there. But the whole point of Elul is to dig within, to search. Again, Elul meaning to search, to see what is that beloved wanting. Am I to my, towards my beloved, my divine soul here? And not only, not only am I towards, am I really doing, you know, launching myself in that motion of going inwards and listening to my heart or listening to my soul, but will I also actualize that calling? That's the whole theme of this month. And I find it really quite moving and no coincidence, certainly, that we are learning this now. Because every one of us is a divine soul that speaks. And the big question is, how much do we allow it to dominate us and to eventually also lead us? That's the big question. By the way, I think that just, just listening to it is already a big feat. Even if we don't necessarily always follow it. Why? Because we recognize that it has room and that it should, it should really be a leader that listening can also transform in many ways. You know, there's a Talmudic statement that comes to mind that it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating one, but just, just to dwell on this a little bit more, to understand this passage of the Tanya a little bit more. But there's a, <laughs> explain this to me, because at first I didn't understand it. It says that in the tractate of Kiddushin, in the Talmud, which is by the way, the tractate that the Dafyomi cycle, the, the ones who study a, day, a page of the Talmud a day is currently learning, but towards the end of the track that it says that one who marries a woman in condition that he is a millionaire and then he turns out to be a pauper, then his marriage is invalid. One who marries a woman in condition that he has blue eyes and he has brown eyes, his marriage is invalid because he was, he was lying. But then there's a statement that says as follows. One who marries a woman in condition that he is a complete tzaddik, complete righteous person. Even if, he tur if it turns out that this man is a complete rasha, a complete wicked person, his marriage is valid. Why? And the Talmud says, Shema hirer bichuva. Maybe when he was giving that condition that I'm marrying you, in condition that I'm a complete tzaddik, he had a thought of repentance. He wanted, deep inside, to become a complete righteous person. And that thought in and of itself transformed him so much so that we consider him at that moment, while he had that thought, to have been a completely righteous person. And therefore, his marriage is valid. Yeah. And that's how powerful the thought of a person is. Mm -hmm. And again, enabling that divine soul to speak to us. Because at that moment, even though we might not be listening to the divine call all the way through, we might not be putting it in the driver's seat, but still, at that moment, I was transformed. That moment, something happened. And then and of itself can become transformative. So that's what I'm saying. And that's the power of the words of the Tanya. That even though the Rasha to whom is good doesn't necessarily follow his divine soul speaking to him, just listening to it is already a transformative moment for the complete Rasha, for the incomplete Rasha. And that and of itself has powers beyond beyond our sight, beyond our imagination. So again, to translate this into our own realm, I would say that that's why when we have, when we feel that divine soul speaking to us, give it some attention. And, and even if you won't follow it all the way through, just giving it some attention has magical powers. And you'll yeah. see that the more you give it attention, the more refined, certainly the more divine you'll become. But that's, that's really the point here.